first thing we do is get my title right. Okay? So it's okay? as in Papa, Pa. Say, please say, Pa. 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 Alright, Pa. B. 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 Okay. And to wake you all up. Pin. Alright, there you go. So, pa beatin. Okay, so that, that kind of clears it up. Uh, can we say it all once again? Pa beatin. Okay, which means something that's hung, a game that's hung up. Okay? Um, oh, let me leave that there. So, uh, I'll be keeping my talk short, but I'll be dealing with like three major areas. One is about uh, the work as a form of appropriation, okay, as a form of like deriving it from practices. Uh, the work as a collective enterprise, because this work is not all completely my work, it's the work of like 27 others aside from myself, and I'll be kind of rounding off with some of like the issues that come up in terms of content, in terms of like maybe political implications, social implications, and then by that time you'll be saying, end it please. <laughs> so first, on the general idea of appropriation or like a friend of mine who does like indigenous music said mining, looking at, looking at practices which you know, people normally do and we ah, all right, there's some gold over there. Okay. The Pabitin is generally a game many of us in the Philippines, all over the Philippines, do to celebrate or to highlight like festivities like birthday parties, baptism, housewarming, and it's basically a game that uses bamboo. So something like this. In fact, we will actually have a reenactment of this game to give away these gifts. The bamboo is normally festooned with like candies, with toys, with fruits, with little uh, trinkets, which children, okay, take note, children are supposed to jump for it. You're considered too crafty and too tall when you get to about 11. Uh, there is a, usually a strong person at the other end. This thing is hung from a pulley at about four meters. There's a strong person at the other end who tricks them by letting it down and then pulling it away and then letting it down and pulling it away until they are made to jump for those things. No? Uh, so it's a trickster game. And from what I could get, although many Filipinos know about it, there's very little uh, historical documentation about it. What I could gather was that it was used initially by the committees who organized religious festivals so that they could get more people to join the procession. Okay. Uh, something that you're quite familiar with most likely. Uh, what they would do is there was a procession done in the harvest time which commemorated the, uh, this is the uh, Catholic ritual of the finding of the true cross by Emperor Constantinople and Saint Helena. In fact, we call it Santa Helena, Santa Cruz de Mayo. And they would have a procession having all of the beautiful women and the handsome men, normally the, the children of the town officers, or the town, the, the mayor, the vice mayor, etc. And in order to gather a crowd, that they'd have a beating to have the kids come. They'd have the, they'd have the toys, they'd have the gifts, they'd have the fruits. Uh, this would be in summer, it would be also the harvest festival. And they'd play it. Once the kids were saved, they'd kind of herd them off, give them candles, and you had now kind of a little bit of a mass action. To the Papitan. What happened was this kind of evolved from just that specific, from just that very specific event. It was like an all-round kind of celebration. So it, it became something that we normally do whenever there was an event. Okay. So what happens now, in fact, is in some, some places in Manila, there are places you can go for hire and have balloons, chairs, tables, and Papitan, which means they already have this thing packaged. Okay, so in fact, we do it for our kids as well. Uh, and, uh, what happened? Well, to me, I suppose seeing it, I, I couldn't help but see that kind of, you know, that kind of uh, tension between the game and some, some greed and some jostling. And, and that whole thing was very appealing. Uh, I suppose uh, having had a bit of a stint in the idea that one should really look towards more indigenous or towards more available, very specific roots for your imagery and art. I found, too, the beating was 
like that. It was just waiting to be grabbed, you know, as it were. And also that, uh, how would you say this? There was, there's lots of like, uh, there's lots of movement, there's an interactive movement. And also, there, okay, I, I came back to Manila, I'd spent some time working as a mercenary in a Singaporean newspaper. Uh, I was like, a mercenary in the sense that I wasn't really thinking of what I did, I just did what I had to do and sold my skills. Okay, and I came back to Manila, it was a very different scene. It was a rather very commercial scene, like most of my old friends who were doing experimental stuff were talking about the latest impressions, things they were doing, which were really selling very much. And I, I kind of said, you really have to sell everything to do. So this, is, was, this was a reaction. Why don't we get something together, get some guys to give artworks and give it away? I said, if, if, if only, I, I, it's, it's, I don't know how far it'll go, okay? I really don't know how far it go, but it's worth, it's worth trying. It's, it's a start, okay? Uh, and which brings me now to the next part, actually. Um, since 1978, I'd also came to a point when I thought that on my own, I might never come up with anything new anymore. And I felt that the only way to put new inputs into the work was to drag lots of other people in. You put in some kind of anarchic chemistry, you hope it turns out right, but you know that it will be chemistry far beyond what you have within you as well. And so that's why I started to do, I suppose it was a little bit of exposure to theater, the dynamic of theater. Uh, having worked in newspapers and magazines as a means of livelihood also brought this about it. It will always have to be an interactive product with lots of tension, lots of give and take, lots of negotiation. And so I said, yes, why not make artworks which also kind of exhibit this notion. So, like in 78, I kind of convinced eight people to work blindfolded and put together a small mural. And then uh, like, there was a work I did that I asked people to come visit my studio over three years and make masks out of one single mold, out of anything that they could find in the studio, and uh, it was all put together. And there was another time when I asked another eight people to do me a shanty. If you've ever been to the Philippines, you'd see that there are lots of urban poor shanties, and I asked them to do me a shanty, and their idea of a shanty, small one and we would have it coming out of the wall of a very posh gallery which I was having a show in. And I, I found it it's very it was a very intense enterprise I think as you all know. But at the same time there was this kind of there was a rush towards the end when things were coming in. There was something that you had not been able to control. There was an input that you yourself might not have thought. And that the total work came out to be like possibly a total failure or a very pleasant surprise. And so I'd always like to work with that kind of, you know, that kind of edgy feeling. I think it uh, kind of kept me going, kept me from being bored. Um, and so, like for this one, for example, what I would do was, when I came back to Manila, I like went around, I went around the galleries, I found out who were doing, I looked up old friends, and I saw the work of new people. And when I saw something that struck me, like in a very personal, very arbitrary way, I found out how to get in touch with the people and I told them about the project. It happens that the invitation came, came by from the Queensland Art Gallery. I said, it might be a nice thing to peddle in their form of like uh, enlightened self-interest. You might like to be part of a bigger thing. And sure enough, I think that helped. So these works are donations, basically. They've given them away to me. I didn't pay them anything. The only thing I paid them was a visit. Okay, and um, my, my reflection with them was to say, think about the game, because many, many of them knew the game. In fact, almost everybody I put, yes, I know the game, we play the game, we have a different way of playing it. We play it with fruits, we play it in December, we play it in summer. I mean, everybody had their interpretation of the game and said, yeah, they were familiar with the game. I said, think about the game, think about what makes people jump off their feet in a both figurative and literal way, and um, reflect on that, give me something that's not too heavy, uh, for, for, of course, for like, safety purposes. Uh, it could be heavy in a contextual way, maybe, but something not too heavy, not so big, because I'd have to compose you all together on a common grid. Okay. And so that's what they did. Uh, this method has its good points as its bad points. I actually had about 32 people I was talking to, some of whom volunteered along the way, some of whom dropped out, 
towards the uh, day before I left, the friend was saying, I'm going to give it to you tomorrow. I'm going to give it to you tomorrow. I said, I'm leaving tomorrow. I'm going to give it to you tomorrow. And I left and he hasn't given it yet. I'm, he may still continue that line when I come back. I'm still going to give it to you. Okay. It's happened several times before. I had a, I also did a collective work before where you know, I asked people to give me a dish to celebrate two years of the new post Marcos government. And so people gave me like some siu pao. I don't know if you know what siu pao is. It's a, it's a Chinese dumpling, large Chinese dumpling, just bleeding. Um, one of the people who exhibited here, the last Rianali Imelda Tahipe in Daya, she gave me a punch bowl full of mud. And I think she found that the, the bourgeoisie hadn't been serving up much more to the, to the common people after as a result of that change. So things like that. Um, you might find, in fact, interesting that there are at least two works here for people who were in the last Triennale. This one, this work is by Edgar Talusa Fernandez, Egay Fernandez, who actually you know better, I think, for the grand mural he did, a kind of socialistic looking mural. And this is by uh, Julie Luch, the lady who did doxology in your last Triennale. So um, this, is a, this is a gathering of like works from people uh, ranging from age 50 to I'd say about 25 and it was really mainly a matter of my taste. That was part of my artwork. My choice, uh, somebody had said, you're not doing art, you're doing curatorship. I said, I don't know, there may be a thin line somewhere there, but I said, I'm just doing it out of like a very gut, a, a very gut feel kind of choice. I'm not, I'm not curating you on, a, on some sort of structured basis. I'm, I like your work, that's about it. It's very, it's very direct. Okay? And uh, one thing I noticed also about this is that groups of artists tend to come and go. Uh, I suppose, I, I don't know why we haven't been able to get over that. But they tend to come and go. So what I like about the work is it's actually like a committee. It exists for one work. If they like to repeat, and like Ega has always been a repeater, he's always joined them. But some people don't. So if they feel that they don't like to join the next work, then you form a new committee. So there's a kind of, you know, there's a kind of lots of, cycling going about uh, and then okay um, so basically that's it it's like putting a work together that is beyond me that surprises me that will surprise all of us I suppose and uh, finding the right structure to do it in this case since the pavilion is normally made of diverse objects it kind of fits okay if you come a bit closer unfortunately this will have to be mounted higher so that you will have to see it actually from underneath because I, I wanted also for people to see what was dangling above us in kind of a social way. And I have four main components. My grid is stylized and I made a kite. Okay, a kite being like ideals in, on a string. It's kind of this compromise with reality. I did something that is supposed to resemble a bomber. I think we kind of all know what a bomber does if we saw the live uh, uh, televised uh, well, for we know what a bomber does. This is meant to be an icon of a satellite, which again dangles above us in a more silent but more potent way. And for us Filipinos, of course, the only Catholic country in Southeast Asia, the cross. Oh, you'll have to see it from below. Yes, but this will be the cross. But uh, I will have to apologize. You, I cannot let you see it exactly very clearly now because it's like on your eye level because I have the hands. Okay. So, that was it. And um, what I did was to try to just bandage my structure in a kind of healing effervescence or something like that. That's why I chose this color. Whatever that might mean for you, I will have to leave it open because everybody has a different reaction to this color. Some find it like saffron, some find it like artificiality. I'll have to leave that open. Uh, bamboo, I must declare outright, I am not a bamboo artist. Okay. I don't do work in bamboo, like, because people have always come and see me <laughs> doing bamboo. I said, do you always do bamboo? No, I said, it's the, it's the idea that drove me to the bamboo, because it's like an appropriation of a form of bamboo. Although now, I really come to think of it, one just might do a couple more projects. Uh, the thing is also, I, I suppose, on an ecological note, bamboo does grow much faster and it's much easier to replenish than many woods and many other kind of resources. So it might it might loom to be one. At the same time, it's also lighter. It can give you form. It can give you some sort of density without having to be too technically ponderous. Okay, so that should be it. I think, uh, sorry, what I would invite you all to do 
is to come on the 29th, we'll have a little, we'll have some balloting, and we'll have a little version of the pabitin. What you can do is get little tokens which correspond to one of these. If you win them, you can take them home after three and all. That's about it. Everybody who has given the work has agreed to the thing. All they get back is documentation and the satisfaction that they know it's in somebody who jumped for it. Right? Who didn't need to have extra money, just jump for it. Okay, so that should be it.